My guest today is someone that has been in the news a lot lately, U.S. House of Representative Congressman French Hill. Mr. Hill is well known for his success at founding and chairing Delta Trust and Bank in 1999. As a young man, French attended Vanderbilt University, graduating magna cum laude with a degree in economics. His intellect, business experience, and professional leadership have been sought by multiple U.S. presidents. Though he only began running for an elected office in 2015, he has been serving his country since the late 80s. French was a senior policy advisor to President George H.W. Bush, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the U.S. Treasury, and senior advisor to Governor Mike Huckabee. He has worked on momentous economic policies between the U.S. and Japan and Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall. French's website boasts he is a Little Rock businessman and job creator. For the past 20 years, he has been working, investing, and creating jobs in central Arkansas across all kinds of industries. Oh, and did I mention French, who was named for his grandmother, is a ninth-generation Arkansan who came by horseback, I guess, or boat (laughs) down the Arkansas River to the Arkansas Post in the late 1700s. It is my great pleasure to welcome to the table the smart, civic-minded businessman and entrepreneur Congressman Congressman. French Hill. Great to be back with you, Carrie. Thank you. Awesome. French. You (laughs) and I are friends. You're a great customer of Flag and Banner. That's how we became friends. You have been patronizing uh, Flag and Banner from I don't even know how long you fly the American flag and the POW. Is that right? Yep. Do I remember that right? Are you military? I'm not. I'm, I'm I'm the son and grandson of fabulous veterans, but I did not serve. So I also want to say that this is the second time you've been on the radio. We had a great visit, and we determined it was four years ago, and gosh, time flies, and it's amazing. And when I think of all the changes in our lives uh, in four years, it's amazing. And I have to start by congratulating you on customer service and a great job, but also what you've done for Taborian Hall. You helped and the me do progress, that. And the progress you've made. So exciting to historic <laughs> preservation you in were our my, city. You were my sixth uh, guest to ever have on. You were standing in the showroom buying a flag, your annual flag replacement. I saw you there. I told you what I'd done. As always, you were like, well, that's a really great thing, Carrie, you to be paying forward your business experience and knowledge because you're a businessman and you like mentoring people. And I said, would you come on the radio? And I was kind of nervous about asking you because you're a busy politician. And you said, sure. And you were the sixth person I ever had on. And I think you kind of gave credibility to me. Well, I don't know about that. You give yourself credibility. I mean, it's uh, terrific. And uh, I've used, uh, I love the company and our bank bought our flags from Flag and Banner. And uh, <laughs> that's been fun. But to me, seriously, uh, when I think of you, I think about perseverance. Read the earliest days of your story when, I mean, right? Four hundred year, four hundred dollars 40 years ago on $400. But recently, you mentioned it a little bit, preservation. Yeah. So I never think that politicians really are ever there for me because I'm not political, political, I'm not politically connected. And I think probably most Americans think politicians are just a little bit out of our reach and they don't think they're ever there. But your office, when I was writing a grant for the Taborian Hall, or really for the Dreamland Ballroom, which is on the top of the Taborian Hall building, which is Arkansas Flag and Banner's home. I was writing a grant for a civil rights grant from the National Park Service, and I needed a letter of recommendation. And I called my congressman, and your office wrote, not once but twice for me, two letters. And I thought, this is what politicians are supposed to do. Yeah, I mean, being a political official, so a politician is somebody who runs for office, and if they win, they become a public official. And what is the role of a public official? It's stewardship. You temporarily have custodial care of whatever your mission is. For me, it's serving the people of central Arkansas for the roughly 800,000 constituents I have in seven counties. If you're on the city council, it's the city council. If you're the mayor, it's the whole city of Little Rock. And so this stewardship notion means that we listen to our constituents about how do we improve the community we're in, and we get that from business people, hospital people, entrepreneurs, uh, people with a historic 
building that needed restored. And the civil rights story in, in a lot of cities in the South was destroyed by Lyndon Johnson's uh, Great Society programs because one of those issues was urban renewal. Mm-hmm. And so many things in our nation were disrupted by that, including the building of the my predecessor, Wilbur Mills <laughs> uh, Freeway through the center of Little Rock, and a lot of the business relocation and housing relocation that went with urban renewal. And we lost uh, that vibrancy of what was Ninth Street's business district, which was the heart of the African-American community when I was a kid in the 60s. And it was a buzzing bee location, you mm-hmm. know, really. And you remember that well. And so Taborian Hall in the Dreamland Ballroom is one of the last it's iconic building. original buildings. We lost Mosaic Templars to the tragic fire and my hat's off to the state for rebuilding it. And it's a stunning mm-hmm. museum. But to lose the original building was heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. And so what you're doing is super important. And your office really has helped me. It really does make me go, oh yeah, I'm, you know, I'm part of the community. I'm part of the people that um, reaps the rewards of what our uh, elected officials do. And I think you're well-respected in Washington. I think that letter from you went a long ways. But let's start at the beginning. Um, You say on your website, you're the ninth generation Arkansan. Tell us about your family. Did they come over? I guess they came to a steamboat. How did they come? Canoes. They came by canoes. (laughs) My my (laughs) My grandmother, my uh, paternal grandmother's family, came to Arkansas as French citizens. They were uh, French colonists in Louisiana Territory, and they settled at Arkansas Post. And her original relative, so my nine generation ago, you know, heir, uh, uh, was um, a French army officer oh. who was here as the commandant of Arkansas Post. Uh, when the Louisiana Territory was French. Then the interesting thing about history is that the Louisiana Territory changed hands to Spanish, then back to French, and then sold to the United States, the fa- famous Louisiana Purchase by President Jefferson. And so this, this man, whose name was uh, Joseph Del Valliere, That's your... Uh, that was her, his name. Uh, your he, great-grandfather or the his, guy that... The, the ninth-generation person. Okay. Uh, yeah, my grandmother's. Great, 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 great. Yep, I don't, even, I don't can't even count. Rattle off that many greats. He served for both the French government and the Spanish government without moving, you know, and so it was one of those things where people just. Uh, How do you change get, your allegiance like that, I wonder? Yeah, they were ordered by the governor of Louisiana to, you know, to do that. And uh, so he came up the Arkansas River to Arkansas Post, uh, up the Mississippi by boat, right. So uh, I've got, I had um, Kate ask you on. She owns Yellow Dog Press, and she's a book collector. And she came in and read me a letter from Harem Whittington on April of 1827. He had come from Boston. Um, William Woodruff, the, who started the Arkansas, Dem- or the Arkansas Gazette back then, had hired him to come from Boston down here. And he writes a letter back to his brother. And I just got to read it because it's... It is hilarious. It is hilarious. (laughs) So he says to his brother, he writes, in the afternoon of Sunday on the 6th, have you heard this letter before, French? Oh, you're going to love it. In the afternoon of Sunday on the 6th day of December, we arrived in Little Rock. Little Rock is situated on the south bank of the Arkansas. Contains about 60 buildings, 6 brick, 8 frame, the balance log cabins. The best building in the place is the printer. It is built of brick and is as good as any office in Boston. Little Rock Academy is a log hut, and the state house is a little low wooden building about 10 feet by 16. The town has been settled about eight years and has improved slowly. The trees are not cut down in the town yet. Instead, in the streets of streets, we walk in cow trails from one house to another. The town, I believe the whole territory, is inhabited by the dregs of Kentucky, Georgia, and Louisiana, but principally from the former, and a more drunken, good-for-nothing set of fellows never got together. (laughs) The Secretary of the Territory and the judges at the Supreme Court drink whiskey out of the same cup with the lowest born and roll together in the same gutter. There have been more than a dozen murders committed here, but the murder has always, the murder is always acquitted. The greatest drunkards fill the most responsible offices. (laughs) Listen to this. 
He goes on to say, of the female part of the community, I have not much to say as there are five grown girls in the township and they are all as ugly as sin and mean as the devil. It's a famous place for parties. I have been to three since I had since I had been here where they have a violin and dance all night. And as they are not girls, enough girls to form a sect, they all the old women dance and then lie in bed the next day. <laughs> the men get drunk and generally have a fight before they go home. Last Sunday, I saw two fringe ladies walking out, each with a young coon in their arms. They are used instead of lap dogs. Pretty nice. Have you never read that? Really? Uh, I have not read that one, but I'm familiar with the Arkansas Territory. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm so glad that uh our citizens can relive that by visiting our historic Arkansas Museum. Oh, wow. Which has, That's a good turnaround. Which <laughs> has, I was proud to serve on that board of directors and build, lead the capital campaign to build our beautiful museum there back in the late 90s, early 2000s. And there you can see William Woodruff's spectacular brick uh, printing oh, shop really? is there. It was built uh, a reconstruction uh, from the plans, and uh, we thank the uh, Natural Cultural Resources Council, NCRC in Arkansas, for the funding to build that building. And it is as fine as anything you'll see in 18th century, early 19th century Boston. And then the State House, the log structure is oh, yeah. still there, obviously, yeah. the mm-hmm. Interlighter Tavern, where people roll to the gutter from on a regular <laughs> basis. Anyway, we're blessed to have that historic. Uh, it says block. it says the Indians sometimes bring deer and buffalo meat to town and try to sell it, but the folks are so so intolerant that they seldom purchase any. They think there is nothing like a dead hog. Woo, pig suey. There you go. <laughs> go hogs. Go hogs. Boy, they got a good get t- they're having they're in a great start this year, aren't they? Unbelievable. I, I have been so excited I know. to watch these kids and watch it and admire our coach for getting the best out of it. So did you really want to be an oceanographer when you graduated from um college? No, I wanted to be an oceanographer when I was a sixth grader. Yeah, sixth and seventh grade. I was fascinated. My dad was so awesome and let me learn how to scuba dive when I was in sixth and seventh grade. And I was uh, interested in all things National Geographic and ocean. Built a submarine. Uh, I mean, I was fascinated by it. But as I as I grew up, I loved the outdoors and I loved uh, science. But I, I, as I became a teenager, I found out that I really wanted to be in business. So. Your dad was t- a banker? Uh, he was an investment advisor. He helped people with their investments. And uh, when I was in high school, I worked for him and learned about reading uh, investment reports and investment research and annual reports when I was in high school working Prospectus. Prospectus, prospecti, and really loved and admired the work he did to help people. And so I knew then I wanted to go into business. And when I was in college uh, during the summers, I worked for the old commercial bank as an analyst, uh, helping them out during the summers and Christmas holidays. You've been in politics longer than I think most people realize. How did you get interested and what was your first gig? Yeah, uh, another great question. So when I was 12, Mm -hmm. 1968-ish, Governor Rockefeller was running for re-election, Winthrop Rockefeller, first Republican governor since Reconstruction. And my across-the-street neighbor was Gertie and Dick Butler, Gertrude Rimmel Butler. She was Raleigh Rimmel's sister, married to Richard Butler. Richard Butler was a, a banker and a lawyer. And they were like my additional grandparents. And they lived next, my grandparents lived on the same street. And so she asked me one day, hey, will you help me pass out leaflets for Wynn Rockefeller for governor? And so I got on my bike and dropped door hangers uh, for his reelection campaign back in, uh, in 68. So... That led me to, as a middle schooler and high schooler, to study political things, and I found out by doing that that I was a Republican. Because Rockefeller was a Republican. He was, but it was the philosophy of the party, which was small business, entrepreneurship, opportunity for all, equal justice under the law, party founded by Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but it was about the small versus the large. Mm-hmm. It was about self-reliance, not the government solving every problem. And you believe in state uh, management more than federal management. I do. You know, uh, I'm a Catholic and if you're a Catholic, you're, you're taught somewhere along the catechism line about subsidiarity, which is a Catholic principle that problems are solved at the absolute lowest level and find their way up, not top down. 
And of course, America is sort of that way, right? I mean, if we want high quality policing in a town, we don't go to our senator or our congressman. We go to our city council and our mayor and talk, God, we, we need better policing here. And so that concept of subsidiarity led me to really have confidence in states' rights and that we ought to try to solve problems in our society uh, at the lowest common denominator, the best place. Yeah. Closest to the people would be another way to describe it. I could never be a politician because I don't ever vote a party line. I vote right. for people. How right. do politicians... Because nobody can get everything right every right. time. No yeah. party can get everything right every right. time. How do you manage to align yourself with your party when you really don't feel like it sometimes? Yeah. Well, I, in the six years I've served in the House, I mean, I've agreed with President Obama on things and voted with him, and I've voted against him on things. And likewise, I, I've served with President Obama the first two years I was in the House, his last two years in office. I mean, I've served with President Trump as the president for four years. Agree with some, disagree with others. The key thing I say is when someone is proposing a policy idea in the House of Representatives, I ask myself, is it in alignment with the Constitution? Is this something the federal government should take on? Is it appropriate for that? And secondly, is it better than current law? Is this idea better than current law? Does this move the ball forward? Is this the Constitution has a general welfare clause. Is it in the best interest of the general welfare of the country and our people? And those are sort of my guiding filters. Uh, so in the case of, of President Obama, I was very opposed to the Iran uh, nuclear treaty. It wasn't a treaty. It was an, an agreement. It wasn't a treaty. It didn't come to the Senate. It was just an agreement he made without approval of the federal government, the you know, legislative branch. And I was very vocal about that. Uh, some of his other trade things he proposed, I was very for some of those. Likewise, with President Trump, uh, his across-the-board steel and aluminum tariffs across all business categories in the United States, I don't support. I don't support him when he did them. I don't support him now. I write letters in opposition to him. I try to get exceptions, try to change it. And other things he's tackled, like Middle East peace, with the way he did for moving the embassy to Jerusalem, something that President Clinton uh, approved of and proposed to do, but did not do, I thought was a good idea. I thought it would change the dynamic in the Middle East and also backing out of the Iran. So no one gets it all right, mm -hmm. I think. And, and as business people, Gary, mm -hmm. this, is, this is at the heart of challenges in Congress. Business people who come to Congress after a career, long or short, are very practical people because business people uh, help People get to yes. You don't build a business by telling every customer, nope, those aren't our hours. Nope, you're not qualified. No, I can't sell that to you. You know, business people get to yes. And so you don't think there's enough business people in Congress? Mm -hmm. No, I, I don't. I think there's uh, in Congress, I think you have a lot of former state legislators, lawyers, a, a lot of lawyers, a lot of people who are very, um, sort of geared to party as an, as an apparatus, right? They really are um, party bound. And so I've tried to find those business people and we've gotten a lot of legislative accomplished by doing it. That. What do you think is Trump's biggest strength and his biggest weakness? Biggest strength is focus on a to-do list in foreign policy and domestic policy that he campaigned on, that he feels strongly about. And I think are generally in the um, mainstream of American political thought. What are those? You know, lower taxation rather than higher taxation, lower regulation rather than more regulation, um, and a sense that letting people keep more of their own and, and encourage business development, that's a pretty American philosophy. And I'd say over the years of America, a bipartisan, you know, mm -hmm. idea. on the foreign policy side, it's American leadership, and yet sharing the load between World War II and the fall of the Berlin Wall in the 90s when I worked for President Bush, the whole concept of Pax Americana was that America had the bulk of the economy in the world and that we were opening our markets and pulling people up. And then by the end of the 1990s, you had Europe on par with the United States in economic clout as an entity. You had Asia rising, the, the, the Asia tigers, particularly Hong Kong, Taiwan, 
uh, particularly, but Singapore had done amazing things since World War II. So my philosophy there is we were all on board that. What Trump has come in and said, that's right. We're proud of that. We did it. But now we're not the largest economy only in the world. We have these other people with amazing economic success. They need to start sharing the economic burden in a more fair way. And just one quick example, NATO. The news media, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's the American alliance with Europe uh, to protect Europe from invasion, principally by either the Soviet Union before the Berlin Wall or an aggressive Russia afterwards. That's the concept. It also has worked to protect Europe from the global war on terrorism. So Islamic terrorists who might infiltrate into Europe. So 28 or so countries of the United States has been the supreme allied commander there. But Jack Kennedy said in 1963, Europe is freeloading on the United States. They need to start paying more of their way. That was 60 years ago. President Trump came into office. He saw that President Bush and President Obama had agreed that everybody would pay 2% of GDP. All NATO member countries will pay 2% of GDP into defense of geared towards the Atlantic partnership. And only six did it. So President Trump said, well, where the, where's everybody else? And he was criticized for that like he's against NATO. And that's what I'd say to listeners. Quit making things so black and white. President Trump is exactly where President Bush was and President Kennedy were about getting Europe to pay more of their way. Germany, the largest economy in Europe, with a budget surplus, a trade surplus, no budget deficit, does not pay 2% of German GDP to protect NATO. And yet, they're one of the principal countries protected by NATO. I wonder why people don't talk about that. Because our society doesn't stick with it. To have enough of a conversation. To get to have a real conversation. I think that's one of the uh, worst sorry, things can, about it. Right. And I think it has gotten worse. And I know uh, you and I are good friends. We can talk about it. But if, if America would have this conversation instead of saying, oh. He know, got out of NATO. Right. And or he's or he doesn't believe in NATO or is against NATO or some. This is just not factually. So accurate. what's his uh, that's his strength. What's his weakness? Weaknesses, I think he talks too much, and I think he tweets too much, I and I, and I think he gets off message. Uh, I think he has a lack of, of uh, if he's focused on that to-do list, right? And I was clear about that, and I think in domestic policy and foreign policy, he has a good working to-do list, and he's accomplished a lot. In business, we'd stay focused on that. Mm-hmm. But President Trump has a lot of entertainer in him, and he just... I think he hurts himself by talking too much and, and not listening enough in reference to your opening monologue. Yeah. All right. This is a great place to take a break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Congressman French Hill, who is running for his third term. Is it your third term? Fourth yeah. Term. Fourth term? Fourth term in a heated race against Miss Joyce Elliott to be the U.S. representative in Arkansas's 2nd Congressional District. Still to come, French's insider view of Washington and the Beltway. I think we've been pretty much getting a lot of that now. What he's most proud of in his three- or four-year term, how he manages to align himself with President Trump's tweet storms, which I think you're going to have to tell us how you really do align yourself with that, and what he wants to accomplish next. We'll be back after the break. You are listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Congressman French Hill, who is running for his fourth term in a tight race against Miss Joyce Elliott to be the U.S. representative in Arkansas's second congressional district. French, you have been in politics since the 80s. You uh, worked for Bush at the end of the 80s as his senior official in the um, what were you, senior uh, economic policy, executive secretary to the president's economic no. policy? Yeah. No. But nobody, or at least I didn't realize that you'd been in politics for so long. I did, why did you decide to start running for office instead of just working in the background? I mean, you worked on some pretty impressive uh, international economic deals with Europe and Japan. So why did you think, well, I'm going to run for Congress now? 
Well, when I was uh, mid-career and had had so much fun in business uh, with Old First Commercial, which is now Regents Financial here, and then starting Delta Trust and running Delta Trust, I got to thinking mid-career I'd like to do something else in public policy, and yet I was living in Little Rock. I wasn't living in Washington, D.C., wasn't uh, 100% committed to living in Washington, D.C., and I thought, well, how, how can I re-engage on uh, uh, public, public policy? What would be the best way to re-engage in public policy? And I thought, I think I'll, I'll run for office. So I was originally going to run for the state legislature. Oh, yeah, I'm surprised you didn't do that. You just jumped right up to Washington. No, I ran, no I ran for the state legislature. Oh, you did? Yeah, I was, I was running. I announced. I raised the money and uh, in 2013 announced that I would run for a state legislative seat here. But about two weeks into that race, Tim Griffin, uh, suddenly surprising everybody in Arkansas, announced that he would not run for re-election to Congress in 2014. And I talked to my family, talked to my business colleagues, and I pivoted. I dropped out of the state house race and ran for uh, Congress instead because I wanted to take that business experience, uh, mm-hmm. that government experience working for President Bush and working for the Senate staff briefly and roll that into one, thinking that I would be a very good representative for Central Arkansas with that mix of of experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, What is the Structural Impediments Initiative? So in the late 80s, uh, the biggest trade rival to the United States in the 1980s was Japan. Japan had come from a a ruin at the end of World War II to very rapidly, with complete help from the United States, to one of the most powerful economic countries in the world. Everything was made in Japan. Everything you picked up, you looked at the bottom, had a little gold sticker on it, said made in Japan. And it was extraordinary. And by the 1980s, they were dominating automotive production. They were dominating semiconductor production. They were dominating uh, certain kinds of steel and aluminum production. And President Reagan uh, was very concerned about that, and he put tariffs on Japan and put voluntary restraints where they would voluntarily reduce exports to the United States. And it feels a lot like the debate we have now about China between the U.S. and China. It's very similar with one critical exception. Japan was an ally of the United States, a friend of the United States, a military strategic partner of the United States. Why would they voluntarily not uh, import stuff to us? Well, they didn't want to have tariffs imposed on Japanese automobiles, which was the most rapidly growing part of their high value exports to the U.S. So we kind of threatened them. If you keep doing this, we're going to put those. Ronald, Ronald Reagan did to Japan the same sort of approach that President uh, Trump is doing on China now, but you have this geopolitical difference between Japan and, and China. So uh, the structural impediments initiative was how can the U.S. on a bilateral basis get Japan to open up their market so we can sell more U.S. material to Japan, more ag, more electronics, more technology, more American cars, and so the structural impediments, what is that's a buzzword. What does that mean? It means the non-tariff barriers that prevent America selling to Japan. What were they? You couldn't have a store larger than about 3,000 square feet. So Walmart could not go to Japan. You could not sell skis in Japan because they had a rule that said uh, skis made in Europe or the United States would not work on Japanese snow. Hello? This is a real thing. And so we were breaking down those trade barriers. Japanese snow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this is crazy. But this is, we were breaking down those barriers to trade that were not a tariff. They were not a price barrier. They were a regulatory barrier. Were these Japan's, these are Japan's regulations that were just these made up crazy regulations? Yes. Okay. And so So you got all those taken down. So we spent two years negotiating with them to take those down to increase opportunities for American business in Japan. We were successful. So what are we doing now with China? China is. Because I really don't understand. Yeah. Does anybody understand? Look, 
No. Everybody's, yeah. everybody's. Go, you, you know, got, their heads are going in circles. Yeah. Yeah. So Japan's, I mean, China's story with the U.S. is we are a friend to uh, China going back to the 1830s. We back China in the uh, opium wars with Great Britain. We gave them military What do you advice. mean the opium wars with Great Britain? Japan, uh, China and, and the United Kingdom, the Great Britain fought a major conflict over the exporting of opium from uh, uh, into uh, China by British merchants who were taking tea and selling the tea in, in Europe, and it was a major issue. Illegally? No. Well, yes, if you, from a Chinese point of view, yes, illegally, uh, against the emperor's wishes. And then we backed China in the 19th, later in the 19th century for the open door policy, which is where Europe was trying to close down trade with uh, Japan. We were for open trade with uh, China, sorry, China. And so we've been a longtime friend to no, China, wait, the United opioid States. is not tea. You're saying. No, this is, don't bog down on this. Okay, I'm, just, okay, I'm okay. just simply saying okay. in the 1830s, when oh, war, 1830s. Okay. war broke out between China and the United Kingdom about uh, them English merchants selling, hooking all the Chinese population on opium. There we you helped, go. There you yeah, go. Sorry, okay. Sorry. We helped China. And that's, that's so long ago. So we've been friends with China that long. That long. Then we helped them with the open door, which was opening them up for trade to other countries in the late 19th century. And then, of course, we sided with China against Japan during World War II in the 1930s when Japan invaded China and murdered millions and millions of Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So when, when we, did we start going south with them? Well, in 1949, the communists took over China and threw all free market people out and all Christians out and all uh, other nations out of China. And they closed their society, really, until uh, Richard Nixon reopened relations with China with his famous, famous trip in 1972, orchestrated by Henry Kissinger. Why? Because we wanted a counter to Russia and the Soviet Union. So we opened up relations with uh, the People's Republic of China. And in 1984, uh, President Reagan really opened the markets in China two-way, in a big way, trade. And China opened up. And under Deng Xiaoping, China's, we thought China over that next years would become a more open society. Yeah. Uh, and what I'm reporting to you is after the 80s, after the 90s, and after the 2000s, the current premier, uh, supreme leader in China, Xi, has shut that down. He wants to be the number one country militarily, diplomatically, economically in the world, and he wants to shut out, uh, you know, the U.S. from our traditional role that we've played in society. And that's happened really since 2012. And so President Trump is saying, what we did was good, we tried, but now we have to recognize that China has changed. They're not going to become an open society. They're never going to become a democracy. Nobody proposed that they would. But they are building a military, building a navy. They are threatening their neighbors. They've taken property from Vietnam, from Taiwan, from the Philippines, from Japan, taken territory, trying to dominate the South China Sea. How, how is what we're doing going to change that? Because we are uniting the world against uh, China's uh, leadership. In are this we? Way. Yeah, we are. I didn't know that the world was uniting against anything we did right now. Well, they what we've done is we've taken the brunt of this trade argument, but we're in alignment with uh, Europe, uh, with Japan, with Southeast Asia, particularly the Philippines and Vietnam, about not allowing China to militarize the South China Sea, not allowing China's technology to dominate telecommunications networks in Japan and Europe. Mm -hmm. This is the Huawei debate. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have agreement on that with our trading partners. And they are public. Read what Prime Minister Abe has said uh, on each of President Trump's visits to uh, Japan, thanking him for standing up to what uh, China is doing in the region. So there's more diplomacy to start. This is just a very early beginning of trying to reset trade relations with uh, China and American leadership there is helping China, us reset trade relations in Europe and Japan as well. And secondly, uh, 
China is becoming a neo-colonial power, impoverishing all of Africa and a lot of Asia with their financial techniques, and we're fighting back against that. In my committee assignment I have, I lead that effort in, in the House to block China's predatory financial relationships in Africa and around the world. I want to talk about what you're doing right now. Let me um, take a break. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Congressman French Hill, who is running for his third term in a heated race against Ms. Joyce Elliott to be the U.S. representative in Arkansas's second congressional district. Still to come, if elected, his plans for Congress. What does he dream about when he's laying in bed with his eyes closed? And he's thinking, when I wake up tomorrow, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I want to remind everyone we broadcast live every Wednesday from 6 to 7 p.m. Central Time on Facebook and at 101.1 The Answer. Also on Fridays, this show is rebroadcasted at 2 p.m. on KABF 88.3 FM radio station. You're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Congressman French Hill, who is in a tight race for his fourth term as U.S. Representative in Arkansas's second congressional district. All right, before we went to break, you were talking about what you're working on now. Do you remember what it was? I do. What was it? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> we're doing great here, friends. <laughs> friends, Roman. Tom, fix that in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> We were talking about China, and you I, said you're working on something I'm, I'm every the, day. I'm the senior Republican on the National Security Subcommittee of, of Financial Services. So we're the committee that reviews sanctions against other countries, uh, financial sanctions, and uh, we also review all the international lending that the World Bank does and the International Monetary Fund. And That's so, not the Golden Fleece. That's the U.S. government's. No, you monitor that. I monitor uh, bad decisions by the U.S. government. And yeah, but that's a different one. Yeah. You're doing that too, though, right? Oh, yeah. So you're reviewing the, 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 the it, this is international what you're doing. Yeah. Right now. And what, okay. what my principal mission's been in recent months has been holding China account and getting my colleagues around the world to support that. China lends money to a country like the Congo. And the Congo agrees that they will pledge their oil and gas revenues to China for that loan. And then China will come in and do some sort of a construction project. And then if China doesn't like the way that turns out, they'll take the oil and gas reserves. Uh, China took the airport in Sri Lanka the same way. They do predatory lending to third world countries and take their property, take their resources, non-transparent terms. And China doesn't play by any of the rules. And so I call that neo-colonialism. And they're going in there, they're taking over these countries, and they're taking over the resources, and they're taking over strategic locations, port mm-hmm. facilities. Right now, they're trying to get the main port in Montevideo, Uruguay, which would all the resources of South America come out the, the river there, and they also can use that as a way to reach the Antarctic basin. They've, you've seen this in Asia. You've seen it in Southeast Asia, India. You've seen it in Africa with what they've done in Djibouti. And so what we're trying to do is get all of our colleagues, like the United Kingdom, France, other members of of the world community, to hold China account, not let them make these non-transparent loans. And we have have directed, bipartisan, passed the House almost unanimously. Democrats agree with me that they should not be allowed to get IMF money or World Bank money if that's how they're going to treat uh, these impoverished third world countries. And there are many nuances on that. But that's why I say this is an all-government process to make China play by the rules. Um, Have you got ways of measuring it? Do you think you're doing a fine job? We're just starting on that. uh, But we are, as we get additional support around the world, I have many African countries working with me on this to demand transparency from China's loans. Mm -hmm in their own countries, and also when they approach the IMF and the world. When President Trump took office, everybody acted like North Korea was going to be the the big concern. But I don't hardly hear anything about North Korea anymore. Well, President Obama, uh, as President Trump frequently reminds people, told him (laughs) that the biggest challenge that he was inheriting was North Korea. It seems like that was in the news all the time. And that's why President Trump decided to do something different in North Korea. We had had a policy in North Korea since about 1995 uh, that the Clinton administration put in place. Bill Clinton gave the North Koreans with the Congress and other countries about $5 billion 
to, and they made a promise they would not develop nuclear weapons. And of course, they took the $5 billion and went on and developed nuclear weapons. And in the Bush administration, George W. Bush, he was preoccupied by challenges in the Middle East. And President Obama uh, didn't really have a new approach to North Korea. So when President Trump took office, he said, let's try something different. Let's try to go to them and engage them to see if we can find out what's really going on with them, what their objectives are, objectives are, because we have no information about North Korea. And that was condemned uh, by the opposition, but he had these meetings, and since he's had these meetings, you know, they have not uh, tried a major nuclear test, and they haven't flown a major uh, intercontinental uh, ballistic missile. So they've reduced their escalation and we got a 15 to 0 vote in the United Nations, President Trump did, uh, Nikki Haley being the uh, ambassador at the time, to sanction North Korea, uh, which was amazing, including China voting with the United States, uh, which I was very impressed by, frankly, uh, on the part of the diplomacy. What do you of, mean sanction? They, we sanctioned North Korea on any uh, interdiction of trying to get defense materials uh, in and out of that country to put maximum pressure on them, including them exporting oil or coal to other countries. And we essentially are operating that still to this day, four years later. We so still, is that why Little Rocket Boy's not doing any more? That's one key reason, one key reason. And behind the scenes, uh, you know, there continues to be attempted diplomacy at President Trump's objective. Then it's not just his. It's been an American objective since 1952, which is a nuclear-free, united Korean peninsula. And uh, so I actually give President Trump credit for trying something different in mm -hmm. North Korea. And, and for the past four years, we haven't had uh, the risk profile that President Obama, you know, was concerned about. Mm -hmm. um, golden Fleece. What is the Golden Fleece? When I was a Senate staffer in my 20s, I worked for the U.S. Senate Banking Committee, and the senior Democrat on that committee's name was Bill Proxmire from Wisconsin. And he was a funny curmudgeon. <laughs> and I really loved him. I thought he was hysterical. And very, he, was a, he would be what you would call a tightwad. <laughs> he did not like excessive government spending. He's not your current uh, version of, of Washington politicians. And he was always railing on a bad regulation or bad spending policy. And he gave out the Golden Fleece Award to the worst example of misuse of government spending. So when I got elected and went to Congress in 2015, I reinvigorated the Golden Fleece Award, which I give out monthly. And just last month gave to the Department of Commerce because, as I said, I don't uh, support across the board steel and aluminum tariffs imposed by the Trump administration. And if you have that, then businesses in America who use an imported steel item can go to the Department of Commerce and ask, ask for a waiver from that tariff product. And they got the Golden Fleece this month because they have done a terrible job granting those waivers, telling people why in a timely manner. And if you're going to impose tariffs like that, then you also need to create the system to grant people the ability to uh, seek a waiver. And so mm -hmm. I think it's a, a case of mismanagement on the part of the Congress. The Golden Fleece Award. You can't beat it. Yeah, smaller federal government, you've said over and over, you've said Americans need to quit trying to fix everything with a top-down, one-size-fits-all approach, instead shift power back to state and local governments. What is the balance of capitalism? Where does capitalism get askew? And yeah. it needs more government. Well, in our system, we have state and federal regulation of that marketplace, right? And you realize that when you look at the work you do at Flag and Banner, you have certain HR rules you follow and certain sales practices and certain Internet sales practices. And you have a refund policy and you have uh, to live with certain rules about extending credit to people. And all those things are meant to have balance in capitalism where it's fair to both sides. It's fair to buy buyer and seller. It's fair to labor and capital. And our country for 244 years has had this fabulous, I mean, that's a great theme uh, in our society, is that balance between labor 
and capital. And that's what uh, a regulatory balance strikes. And we work to, to find that balance in our society all the time, both at the state level and at the federal. Russ, it's not five minutes till an hour. We didn't start till 3.20. His show does not go for a full hour. And we don't run a full hour on either station. Well, we might want to cut a few things off, so I'm going to let it go just a few seconds over. You're a good, you have? You're so good. I forgot what we were talking about. He's flashing me back there in case you didn't know. Oh, I can only imagine. <laughs> Don't use that word. Yeah, that's really not where we were coming from. <laughs> uh, people who are Facebook. A hat and a trench coat, okay? <laughs> what were we talking about? Capitalism. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let's talk about Social Security and disability. A lot of people don't realize that that's a government handout. They're like, don't tax, don't, I don't want, uh, what is it? I don't want the Affordable Care Act because it's socialism, but don't take away my Social Security and disability. And uh, do Americans really understand that? Do they realize that? Medicare? I think I think uh, Americans understand that Social Security uh, is something they pay into out of every paycheck, uh, and that they have a real uh, expectation that Social Security will be for the, there for them when they retire, and they should. That's it's a promise. It's one of the highest taxes in your right in your paycheck. That right. You- I'll never forget as a teenager being paid uh, to work for the first time, and I said, "Who is FICA?" <laughs> and why is FICA taking so much out of my check? It's seven and a half percent they take out of your check, and then everybody and, and out then, of the employer's side too. And and then and the employers match it, so there's right. you know fifteen percent going into the government, which right. you couldn't take that away from Americans now if you try. No, and I don't. Don't you think the Affordable Care Act will be exactly thought about exactly the same time once it finally gets? where everybody's paying a little bit into it and then they get free health care that they're going to feel exactly the same way. Don't take away my health care. Well, on Social Security, no, I, I guess I don't because they're not, uh, that's not how it's set up. It doesn't quite work like that. But uh, it could. Uh, it could. If but, it was mandated on everybody's paycheck that a, a few percentages were taken out, could we have uh, health care for everybody? Well, I think we could have health care for everybody if we had a competitive system with price transparency where you had real competition in the market where you wouldn't have these extraordinary increases in costs. And I don't think a government-mandated monopoly system will produce more competitive prices. We don't see that in higher education. We don't see it in veterans' care. I think you'd see ration care. I think you'd see care uh, more expensive, less available. I think you'd see fewer health care providers. We already have a huge shortage of doctors and nurses and other health care providers. So I think we have to find ways to make uh, the system more transparent, more uh, competitive. And I don't think the ACA did that. I think the ACA in the area of expanded Medicaid, for example, provided more access, but it didn't make it more competitive over in the health insurance market. That was a goal. But I think after 11 years of it that we haven't realized that goal. In fact, we, it, have, we have fewer insurance offerings on the exchange now than we did 10 years ago. And in some cases, we have only one, one offer, so you have a monopoly. Isn't insur- health insurance and uh, health care a, a free trade market right now? So why is it not working now? No, I don't think it's a free market. I think it's a government uh, oligopoly. Right now? Yeah, I think it's a government oligopoly set on prices by uh, the way prices set between insurance companies, which is, is exempt from competition. They're exempt from the antitrust rules. The insurance, health insurance companies are. Uh, and so you have a handful of health insurance companies operating in each state under state regulations that are exempt from uh, things I think would improve competition and transparency. You have essentially a private contract. Well, how do we get rid of that? Uh, Republicans have had bills in Congress for years to break down the uh, lack of competitiveness by health insurers and open that up and open up the ability for people to buy insurance differently. Why can't we do both? Why why didn't that ever happen? uh, At least in my six years in Congress, they've been blocked by Speaker Pelosi. 
I have never heard anybody ever. So maybe the word's not getting out. I never hear what the plan is to uh, replace the Affordable Care Act. We have a we passed in 2017 out of the House a full plan that covered uh, everybody that maintained uh, fund federal funding for states with uh, Medicaid expansion or not because some states did not expand Medicaid as you know and you have to treat all states equally under our Constitution and we expanded coverage for families uh, for different kinds of families large and small single people don't need to pay the same insurance premium that families pay. And we also fully covered and fully funded pre-existing conditions for anyone with a pre-existing condition. And when we did that, the actuaries told us that it would be more coverage and at lower prices than were under the Affordable so Care Act. So, if the, so because I'm a business person, mm-hmm. I love the Affordable Care Act. I love anything that you can come up with that takes uh, small businesses out of the business of providing health insurance to my employees. Because I cannot compete with large companies because my pool is not big enough. Right, and that's exactly why you should. I'll be happy to send you a stack of things to read about oh, Republican gosh. ideas. Please don't make me read this. To <laughs> to allow small business to be able to have the same competitive buying capability that uh, companies over one thousand have. I that's hated, it. That's, I that hated would that, be that it when right I was now. at Delta Trust. We had one hundred and thirty seven employees. I wanted to have a much more creative health plan. I wanted to charge people who smoked more, for example. Uh, others didn't, and uh, you know, and you couldn't do it. You had to buy an off-the-shelf mm-hmm. item, and the price went up every year. Every year. And so I know how horrible it is for the small business market. That has not been solved per se by just having those people suddenly go and get government-only health insurance. I think we ought to be able to offer a competitive market where that small business has the same ability to get affordable health care that a big company. Uh, I want to remind everybody you're listening to Up In Your Business with me, Carrie McCoy, and I'm speaking today with Congressman French Hill, who is running for his fourth term as the U.S. Representative in Arkansas's second congressional district. I realize that nasty politics have been around forever. I mean, McCarthyism in the 1950s. Um, But is this an exceptionally difficult time? Well, for 244 years, we always have... Uh, better divisive political campaigns. I mean, uh, we just need to look at the uh, her Hamilton duel made famous by the play Hamilton for everybody to recognize the most divisive election probably in American history is still the election of 1800, followed by 1876, which was settled by a commission of the Supreme Court and the Congress uh, after the end reconstruction, bitterly divisive. It made Bush v. Gore in 2000 look like child's play. So we have a history of aggressive uh, campaigning in this country. But look at what the outcome is for 244 years. If you're a positive person like I am, and you are, you see America get better over that continuum since its founding because we believe in Lincoln's uh, uh, imperative that we would strive for a more perfect union. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would be, what's more bitter than the politics of 1860. So we're, we're doing fine in this country. I think social media has uh, been a point of, of, of really hurting civil discourse that when you were doing radio shows or TV interviews, live TV interviews and doing newspaper interviews. um, And that was the common language Uh, And that was a shared community experience, a town hall experience, if you will, that it gave people a lot more information on both sides around which to take judgments. And social media, I believe, is is uh, really increased short term divisiveness in our society. And we all have an obligation to try to not, uh, you know, encourage that where we can. But you've got campaign season is campaign season. And the pendulum will swing, and it'll come back to the center. I feel like we in the infancy of learning about social mm-hmm. media, so and it'll swing back, and we'll figure out how to use it more wisely, I think. Uh, so your last question, what's your motivation? What do you want to do the next time you get to Washington? Yeah, well, I, it's, I love the past six years of working for veterans and demanding more accountability, getting veterans taken care of. We've gotten $23 million back for veterans in the six years I've served. So proud of that. Many of them, Vietnam veterans that weren't treated fairly by the system, to be quite frank. 
And I love the economic development opportunities. I've You're so good here. at that. Uh, we love it. I mean, I have wounded warriors on my staff, and they're terrific. They've mm-hmm. served in uniform and been wounded in action and now work for the How's Arkansas, Arkansas people. changed since you became an elected official? Well, for the, for the better, when I think of my business career and being a chamber chair here, I see us finally treating people right when it comes to education, where in the 80s we were going to be a college-bound only society. And when you do that, you increase the dropout rate. You frustrate people. You don't give people opportunity when they turn 18 to pursue happiness because you demand that success is only measured by a four-year degree. And in just the six years I've served in the House, I am so fired up about Be Pro, Be Proud, which will be a great interview for you, the guys who run that program for the what state of Arkansas. Be Pro, Be Proud. We go to every middle school and we show people how they can get a data science job, a healthcare job, a welding job a skilled trades job and how much money they can make when they're 18 years old. And it's wonderful. But we're also changing Little Rock, North Little Rock and Pulaski County schools for the academies of Pulaski. Uh, We've done that in North Little Rock before. We've done it in Conway. We're doing it in Saline County. So I think we're focused on better outcomes for our kids coming out of school. And that that makes me happy. And you're trying to fix the disability. uh, I am. Disability system. You think it's going to break Social Security? I do. I think it could. I mean, I think it's also unfair. Uh, and what I'd like for people when they apply for uh, a Social Security disability, they're, these are people who are not eligible for Social Security. They've been typically injured in some work environment, and they want to apply for Social Security disability, typically as a short-term disability matter. But the, the, the issues are they don't. I mean, really, over 90% of the people stay on it until they're eligible for Social Security. So my plan that I have would encourage people to self-select. I do want to get back to work. I want you to help me pay for education, help me to pay for some of the things necessary to do that. And if you do, I'll get off Social Security disability. And it creates a carrot instead of a system that's just built with sticks. And I think that if you get stuck in the house on disability, you lose your self-worth. You don't realize what it can do to you to not have a career. And if you make it too easy to stay home sometimes, you will just take the easy way out. And I do see lots of people in my business who uh, who come in and say, I can only make so much money because I'm on disability and I can't. I don't want to lose my disability. So they miss opportunities that lie outside their house. Right. This would allow them to... Uh, make that transition Mm -hmm. and not have that impediment not to make the transition and get them back in the workforce. And that's what we want. We want people in this country working. We have a huge shortage of workers across so many industries. We We sure do. We absolutely do. I've enjoyed talking to you as always. I love it, Carrie. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. I've got your present. You know, I didn't give you this the last time you were on your show, but that's a U.S. and Arkansas flag to go on your desk set. I don't know if you have one. You probably do. I do not. Thank you. I can't believe that. Did you did you smoke the Cuban cigar she gave you last time? I don't recall that. I don't remember. <laughs> that. I did give you a Cuban cigar the last time you were on for birthing yeah. a business. That That's was my right. that yeah, was yeah. my theme back yeah. then. I gave everybody cigars, and I thought, what? I'm in the flag business. Why don't I give everybody a flag for their desk? Exactly. Duh! Instead of giving them cancer, I don't know what I was thinking about. <laughs> thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. In closing, to our listeners, I want to thank you for spending time with us. We hope you've heard or learned something that's been inspiring or enlightening and that it, whatever it is, will help you up your business, your independence, or your life. I'm Carrie McCoy, and I'll see you next time on Up In Your Business. Until then, be brave and keep it up. If you like this video, subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the picture of Carrie's face in the center of the screen. For more of Carrie's interviews, click either video on the right of the screen. And as always, thank you for watching.